In the summer of 2019, the Democratic majorities in the state legislature and then Governor Andrew Cuomo adopted the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, an ambitious law designed to combat climate change by setting greenhouse gas reduction and renewable energy goals for the Empire State. And while there are long-term savings and benefits projected from this green transition, which have been touted by champions of the law, the implementation costs have been less highly discussed. For a more in-depth discussion of those costs and how the new New York should go about trying to implement the CLCPA. We're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Ken Gerardin, Research Director for the Empire Center for Public Policy, a fiscally conservative think tank based in Albany. Welcome back to the show, Ken. It is nice to be back in the hut, Dave. So we're four plus years into the implementation of the CLCPA law. So what prompted you to do a deep dive into the costs associated with this green transition at this juncture? The Climate Act has been hanging out there over the state economy for more than four years now. And we hear a lot about it where companies are talking about how it's increased uncertainty, it's increased costs. It's something that is directly affecting our core mission at the Empire Center, which is to look for ways to improve the state's business climate and its economic competitiveness. I went back and reread the law last year, and I was really surprised to see that the statute had called for these detailed cost estimates for how the state was going to achieve its programs, because the Climate Act is kind of a blank check to state agencies to go and regulate emissions wherever they are, basically however you have to. And the statute says you have to figure out what the cost of these policies are going to be. These cost estimates never happened. Looking further, we found out that the state was several years overdue with doing the state energy plan and with doing a legally required reliability study. So it seemed like a good time to, to kind of look comprehensively as best we could at where the costs were shaping up for the Climate Act because we didn't get these detailed cost estimates and where kind of some other warning lights were about problems with grid reliability. So we hear from NYSERDA and the Hochul administration more broadly about, say, the costs associated with, say, new renewable energy projects and essentially what they will cost ratepayers. But what are some of the other areas of the transition where costs maybe aren't as uh, transparent and there maybe is a certain level of opaqueness to the process? Well, you've got two halves to the Climate Act. You've got the part where we're going to decarbonize the economy and the part where we're going to decarbonize the electric grid at the same time. So you have, on the grid side, you've got the renewables, which have some price tags. You've got these transmission upgrades. You've got a lot of new power lines going in, for which we're, we're just now seeing costs. Those costs are rising. Those costs weren't really recognized by the legislature in the two hours that they were debating the Climate Act in 2019 in the Senate's case. And then on the economy side of things, you've got about a quarter of our emissions in New York are heating related. And there hasn't been any kind of comprehensive cost estimate for what it's going to cost to not just electrify heating, but also do the necessary insulation upgrades. That's just one segment of the economy. That's without getting into the, the industrial sector, the transportation sector. The state put out these cost estimates where they said it would be something in the range of $270, $290 billion. This was the closest they came to fulfilling the statutory requirement for a cost estimate. This was in December 2022. They put out these cost estimate figures. And I looked at it. It's just one It's one little chart in a you know several hundred page report. And I, I started pulling that apart and come to find out they get it from $4.9 trillion in costs and then subtracting $4.3 trillion in avoided costs. Now, for one thing, that difference is $600 billion over 30 years, not you know sub $300 billion, like they were saying. But this is all based on a really crude estimate on their part. They're looking at taking you know, what amounts to something like you know 15% of GDP over that period of time and reprogramming it. And there's a lot of assumptions based into that because they're, they're trying to speculate on what costs are going to be in 2030, 2040, and even out to 2050. What does the lack of information, as you've described it, mean for the path forward? Does it mean we should put everything on hold until these studies are done in a more meaningful way? Or do you think we have to do something else? The study should be getting done regardless of what's happening on the policy execution front, but it's, an, it's a good time to step back and say, what did the Climate Act do? The Climate Act didn't set 
policy, the Climate Act set goals, and then told the State Department of Environmental Conservation and the Public Service Commission and other agencies to develop the policies to get to that goals. That's not the way state government is set up to run. Like there's, there's a reason that elections are held every two years for the Senate and the Assembly. They are the policy-making bodies, together as the legislature, the policy-making body of the state of New York. They should be the ones deciding what taxes are added, what things are banned, what stuff should be happening to reach those goals. They shouldn't be just firing and forgetting, giving it to the State Department of Environmental Conservation and essentially putting climate policy on autopilot because that's where things really, really go off the road. And one thing I looked at in a, a report we issued last month at the Empire Center was what the state's tra track record was of trying to predict the future in the way that the legislature seems intent to do right now with letting DEC figure stuff out. And the state has a really bad track record on the energy front of trying to predict what costs will be, what the most efficient way forward will be. They've got a few pretty bad marks on their track record in terms of you know, having lost a billion dollars a pop on multiple things and made some other really bad predictions. With regards to your critique of the legislature and governor essentially delegating too much of their authority. We see this in other areas, though. We've got a Child Poverty Reduction Advisory Council, which is tasked with figuring out a way to hit a statutory goal on reducing child poverty. And more broadly, every time the legislature passes a law that isn't deeply prescriptive, it's left up to state agencies to write the regulations to actually implement those goals. So it seems like this is a natural extension of that. In most other cases, you see much smaller questions than the full decarbonization of the economy and the electric grid getting worked out at the agency level. More often than not, you see the state setting a policy and just tasking the agency with the execution of that policy. This is different because here the state has set goals and it's allowed the state bureaucracy to figure out the policies that get to that goal. And when you let the state agencies be the ones deciding the policy as opposed to the market as a whole, you're guaranteed that you're not going to get the most efficient path to the best goal because not only do they just have a knowledge problem where they don't have complete information about the economy but you also get political considerations and you're going to start to see this more and more as the as DEC is now multiple months late in promulgating the regulations as people are saying well we should make these considerations for affordability there are people saying we should have these considerations for different affected parties the more you start to constrain the creation of those policies with political considerations, the further and further you go away from the most efficient path to your target. Well, before we move on, let me reintroduce you for listeners just joining us. We're speaking with Ken Gerardin. He is the research director for the Empire Center for Public Policy, and we're talking about the costs and implementation associated with the 2019 Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. So given the circumstances that you've outlined what seems to be the path forward that you're recommending, though? Is it to scrap the goals of the 2019 law because they're too expensive to implement? Is it the legislature taking back more responsibility in these decision-making? What would you like to see happen? The legislature should be back in the driver's seat. They should not be letting one agency do policy making, another agency levy taxes. Uh, these are jobs that the legislature is vested by the, you know, trusted by the people of the state of New York to do. It's hard to justify cashing the paycheck for, I think it's $142,000 per year now, plus benefits, plus expenses. I think that's what senators and assemblymen get paid right now. I'd, I'd have to look and see if they increased it again without me knowing about it this time. But they are paid for that job. And when you have things like you know, DEC getting ready to ban gas stoves and getting ready to put essentially a tax-like charge on all fossil fuels and emissions-related activities across the economy, those are things that should be debated by the people's representatives rather than constructed in the state bureaucracy. And when you say ban gas stoves, are you referring to the restrictions on hookups of new gas utilities and eventually the phasing out of gas utilities in New York? I'm, I'm talking about the proposed proposed ban on replacement units beginning sometime after 2030. We have yet to see the exact year, but those are regs that we were expecting to see two months ago. So if I'm taking a cynical read at what you're saying, it almost seems like you're looking to put in hurdles that would prevent the state from 
achieving the CLCPA, that you're looking to put up sort of roadblocks and, you know, maybe devaluing the importance of these green energy goals as environmentalists see it. So I guess, big picture, do you see value to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and promoting a, a renewable energy in New York? Uh, there's value to reducing emissions. The question is, do you do it at the state's expense? This is something that should be getting figured out at the national level, not the state level. And you know, the state's climate folks will be the first to tell you. They're scared to death about something called carbon leakage, mm -hmm. which is the state goes, puts two onerous restriction on companies, and those companies either expand elsewhere or close their operations in New York. My recommendations that I've made are ways that the state can get to its emission reduction goals more efficiently. So, for instance, you mentioned renewables. They should stop looking at things in terms of renewables and start looking at things in terms of zero emission stuff. New York's definition of renewables excludes hydroelectric power in most instances. Like, if, if you're upstate, hydroelectric power from Canada doesn't count towards your renewable energy targets. Um, only New York City gets that privilege, by the way. Um, nuclear is, is really out of the equation at this point. Even things like biogas, where we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions from landfills by burning off that gas and generating electricity, doesn't count towards the state's definition of renewables. And why is that? Because it was made with political determinations in mind. The people who wrote CLCPA wanted solar panels, they wanted wind turbines. They were more interested in that and the jobs that those projects would create than they were in lower emissions. And you mentioned the idea of reliability. Isn't the New York independent system operator supposed to be the safeguard as we move forward? Aren't they the ones who can essentially trigger delays in the implementation if there are concerns about reliability? No. Interestingly, the grid operator doesn't have the power to step in under the, the way the Climate Act is written. They were given some powers five years ago when the state was trying to shut down a small subset of power plants in New York City called peaker plants, predominantly in New York City. These are plants that they tend to be older, they burn a little dirtier, and the state was looking to reduce the ozone emissions. So not greenhouse gas emissions, but, but ozone, particularly with an eye to air quality. And the grid operator said, no, if you go ahead and force the shutdown of the number of plants that you're looking to do, and by the way, the state didn't know how many plants they would be shutting down with these regs. If you go to do this, we're going to have a reliability issue. We aren't going to be able to guarantee that we have the lights on, you know, in their case, on the hottest day of summer 2025. And this is something that the state should be giving much more deference to in terms of not just what the grid operator says is necessary for reliability, but just the normal the capital investments in power plants that are necessary to keep the lights on. Because if you read some of the state's climate policy projections, they assume they can keep about 80% of the fossil fuel plants online in 2030, having told all of them that they're going to be shut down by 2040 and having prevented any major upgrades between now and 2030. So they're making a bet that even with essentially the death penalty hanging over them, these plants are going to continue to make investments and upgrades that are necessary for them to almost all be available by 2030 when they are only going to be allowed to run at about a third of the time that they're expected to run now. Because the state's hope is that those power plants get displaced by you know, predominantly by offshore wind, but to a lesser extent by solar. So uh, this is one of the perils of trying to you know, essentially play SimCity 2000 with the electric grid and pretend that you can just you know, put up the right number of power plants and power lines and everything's going to be hunky-dory. And that goes back to the knowledge problem. The fact of the matter is the state of New York doesn't know what the grid's going to look like in 2030. They don't know what demand's going to look like. They don't know what, what technologies will be available. They've, they've slammed the door on a lot of new ones, but there is, there's a complete lack of knowledge. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this conversation. We've been speaking with Ken Gerardin. He's the research director for the Empire Center for Public Policy, and you can find his report, Green Guardrails, at empirecenter.org. Ken, thanks for visiting us in the studio. Thanks for having me. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by Resorts World New York. With over 1 million square feet of space to play, relax, and celebrate, Resorts World New York City hosts more than 5 million visitors a year. That makes Resorts World a significant social and economic partner for local businesses and residents alike. Through its operations and outreach programs, Resorts World has generated more than $4 billion for the state educational system and 1,400 jobs for the people of Queens. 
More information at rwnewyork.com.